Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. This week's guest is really going to help all of us out. If you ever felt that you couldn't do something, Barbara Corcoran is going to talk you right out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is the original can-do girl. Is it true you had 22 jobs? You got fired from some of them, not all of them. Not all of them, but I enjoyed every one of them, I must say. And then you borrowed a thousand dollars from a friend. Not a friend, a boyfriend. A I boyfriend. Slept with him for oh the my money. God! But I was going <laughs> to sleep with him anyway, so who cares? So you got a thousand dollars from him, and you decided you could be a real estate person. Well, actually, he had suggested you'd be great as a real estate broker. I thought, hey, why not? I've had so many different jobs. I'll try that one too. That is amazing. Yeah. Lucky, and, lucky and, break. And you turned out to be great at it. Well, on a good day, not every day, believe me. I've had my walk. Well, we've got loads of questions for you. So uh, the people are right there in the camera. Mm -hmm. Die. I mean, we have so many questions. It's just amazing. They're dying to know what you think. This is from Catherine. Mm -hmm. She says, help, I'm buying a house for the first time, and it's a for sale by owner transaction because neither of us has a broker. I feel lost. Fees, closing costs, points. Who could help me navigate this process? Catherine, you know what you need to do? You need to hire a buyer's broker. They'll charge you anywhere from 1% to 3%, sometimes a flat fee to represent you, but I'll give you two reasons why. One, you're going to feel a lot more secure, and secondly, you're going to get a better deal because people don't negotiate well for themselves. And if you want to get the right price on the house, you're going to have to know the history of sales and exactly how hard you can negotiate. And if you're not a bad guy, you're not going to do a good enough job. You need a front man, and that's called a buyer's broker. Oh, that's great advice. Good, Catherine. Catherine. This is from Danielle. Hi, Barbara. I have a large family. I have pictures of them all over my house. <laughs> but I've heard from friends that when you have an open house, you should strip down your family photos. Do you agree with this? And if so, why does that work? Well, I think the word strip down your family photos sounds pretty dramatic. Yes, it does. But this is why you want to get rid of all your personal items. You could leave a few up, but what happens is when the buyer walks through the door, they have to visualize themselves living in your space. And when you have a lot of family photos or personal uh, knickknacks of kind, all over the place they can't see themselves living there that's the only reason so get yourself a nice little box put them all in the little box you can put them right back up after they leave but you should get rid of oh, your personal I would have thought just the opposite to make it warm and cozy yeah, to make it warm and cozy and say oh nice family lives here maybe yeah, but I could be happy but here. you know what it is it's your family yes not oh, that's great family. that's great advice uh, this is from Victoria Barbara can you give some tips for staging your home uh, the key with staging a home is very simple. Get rid of at least a third of your stuff. Put it in storage. I've never seen a home that didn't need to get rid of their stuff because buyers can't see past clutter. Now that you've gotten rid of your stuff, what you want to do is make your home as light and bright as you can. The reason being is after location, the number two reason that buyers cite for choosing a particular home is light. So you want to clip back your hedges, paint your walls white, get up the wattage, get white lampshades, do anything you can to let light in because that's a great motivator in selling. This is great advice. Well, you're easy, my God. Oh my God, are you kidding? Well, maybe because I don't want to sell my home, but, it's ah, fine, but it all sounds you'll good. You'll be a pain in the neck when it comes time to sell, I'm Oh, sure. I'm sure. <laughs> this is from L. Johnson. I applied for a mortgage with my bank, Chase. But I was turned down. What do I do now? Wow. What do oh, I do now? Oh, think of yourself as just going on one date before you get married. What you want to do is hire a mortgage broker. They charge nothing. Just go to a mortgage broker, give them the incidentals on your income, your assets, what you owe, and within 10 minutes they'll tell you which banks will lend to you and which ones won't. Don't stop at the one bank. Usually the bank you're already married to gives you the least good deal. It shouldn't be, but for whatever reason that's the way it usually is. But well, why, why would they not charge you? anything. I don't trust somebody who doesn't charge anything. Because they're working on a commission basis and if you decide to do business with them, then they get paid by the bank oh. to do the mortgage transaction. Oh, I see. I yeah. see. Okay. Cost you nothing. Worth yeah. A worthwhile stop. Uh-huh. Okay. This is from Anna. Hi, Barbara. I'm really impressed with how you had so much success while you were so young. What advice do you have for how to be successful as an entrepreneur? What qualities do you think a person needs to be a successful entrepreneur? I think the first quality you need to do is, or to have, is to be too stupid to know any better. This, <laughs> no, it's the truth. If I hadn't started my business when I was 24, by the time I was 30, I would have thought of a hundred reasons why I would fail. Right. There's something beautiful about being a kid jumping off a board and not having any idea what a belly flop feels like. Right. And I think that's key. The other quality I would say, after all the years of building business, is now, I would say the main quality is not the great idea, not the ego drive, not the hustle, but being able to take a hit and get back up.
Mm -hmm. Because building a business is nothing more than a series of rejections. And I say if you can take the rejections and stand back up, you make it through the finish line. That's the number one So quality. how do you take a rejection? I mean, I know that what I always say to young mm -hmm. actors, I say try not to take it personally. It's so hard. I know. Though. It is personal. I know. That's why you but take it But you have to personally. try not to because otherwise all the air goes out of your body. Oh, definitely. You know, you know uh, what I would add to that? Because it's hard not to take it personal because it's directed at you, right. not the guy next to right. you. But I think that what you should do is give yourself a limitation on how many minutes you have to feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> You're going to get kicked in the gut and it's going to hurt. You're human if you have any feelings. Right. But then you should realize you can't take a lot of time feeling sorry for you. Give yourself a half hour, an hour, That's but then great. you have to get back That's up. That's so great. This is live from Storm. Hi, Storm. Mm, what Just, a crazy name. Yeah, that's a great Ooh. name. Hi, Barbara. You're such an inspiration for women in business. When you're looking at a business as a potential investor, what is the one thing that's a definite no? A definite no in any business, particularly on the Shark Tank show, is if someone can articulate why I should buy. Hmm. Because if the top of the firm, the lead guy, the lead dog, isn't a great salesman, who the heck is going to sell the product? So if you're not selling me, I'm out. It's like, forget about it. You're never going to make a business of it. You have to be able to sell. That's great. This is live from a guest who didn't leave a name. Condos in Florida are real cheap. Is it wise to buy them and hope the value will increase? That's a wild card. You know, prices in Florida still have a long way to go. If you've got a brother-in-law or some mean attorney who's going to negotiate on your behalf and you know you're going to buy in Florida anyway, it's a great time to buy. But you got to hammer down that price. And I find that most people don't know how to negotiate. So if you can get a bad guy to represent you, why not if you're really going to buy Florida anyway? And who's the bad guy? Your brother-in-law? Whoever, whoever's the meanest guy you don't like, just pay him to represent you. That's great. Uh, this is from uh, Debbie. Can the agent that helps me list my house represent me when I buy my next house? Sure they can. And if you're smart, you'll ask them for a discount. Because the truth of the matter is, is they're getting a double deal. Uh -huh. And if you make that suggestion before they sell your house and do a two-for-one kind of a thing, uh, you'll get a great savings. So sure they can. Yeah. And you know what? There's no better person anyway because you've learned to live with them. You know the nuances and... You're kind of used to each other. Nothing's wrong with that if you like them. And I would imagine they would they would think it logical that you get some kind of a discount for being able to have two transactions. Well, you know what? What it is really to them is you're promising to buy from them. Do right. you know what an asset that is yeah. in a world where you get ten rejections for every one yes? Right. They're going to run like crazy. That's to, great. To make you happy. Good advice. This is live from Misha. She's right there in the mm -hmm. in the camera. Barbara, I know you started your business with a small loan and you created a hugely successful empire. What advice do you have for a woman who's considering starting her own business, mm -hmm. especially in this crazy economy? I think my best advice for you particularly is the best time to start any business is in a lousy time. Because you know why? All the big guys out there aren't spending money. They're laying low. They're waiting for the storm to pass. And so if you could get out there in a bad market, the whole universe is open to a new idea. They're willing to maybe try on somebody new. I always had my best years building my business when the things were really, really bad. Oh, that's great. And that's good for all of us to know because we're building MarloThomas.com ah. <laughs> for the bad economy. <laughs> this, is from, this is from Lana. My mortgage company called me to refinance. Should I be leery? Not at all because you know why? They're afraid you're going to go out and shop the market and they might lose you as a good paying oh, customer. Oh. So if you're paying your mortgage on time, you should take that advantage and say, how good a deal can you give me? And then also shop the market anyway to make sure it's a good deal. Ah, that's interesting. Interesting. Well, you know everything. No, I don't know. You're just getting me lucky questions today. There's a lot I don't <laughs> this know. This is great. This is live from Hope. What kind of business would you never invest in? Mm. I would never invest in a business owned by the wrong entrepreneur without mm -hmm. the fire in his belly. Other than that, anything's a go. I have seen lousy products reinvented and brought to the finish line just because the entrepreneur was so good. So it's all about the person, not the product. Huh. So it's probably going to be Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, oh, he could sell you anything. Well, look at that crap he has there. <laughs> he's he's amazing. I Even the presidency he was selling. I know. you got to hand it to That's the guy. Right. I do. But I'm happy he's not running because now I don't have to move out of the country. I was all set to move out. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, this is live from a guest. I want to start a business, a brand, really. I need around 15000 
unemployed loans are not possible, friends and family are not an option. Any suggestions? Well, of course, the great majority of the entrepreneurs out there get the money from family and friends, mm -hmm. nine out of ten people. But there's also a small business administration with a lot of money to lend, but people don't know how to get their hands on it. And it's out there, particularly if you're a minority and if you're a female. Is this a woman or a man? Laura, what was it? Yeah, can't remember. Laura, okay, okay, you're a minority, believe it or not, even though most businesses today are being started by women. You can get your hands on money if you go to the federal government. They keep granting more money as long as you go online and put loans to entrepreneurs, U.S. Lo pardon me, U.S. loans to entrepreneurs. You'll find money. Wow. That's great. I bet everybody's running right now. Hey, why not? <laughs> Don't, come back, come back. That's the easy part. Making a go of it's the hard part, though. This is from Paige. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the key to selling a house? advertising, internet exposure, or promotion to other agents and realtors? None of the above. The key to selling a house is to undercut your neighbor. They're your enemy. They're competing with you in selling their house. So you have to go out and walk in the shoes of a buyer, go to a bunch of open houses, see what houses are selling for, and then undercut the price. Price is 90% of all house sales. I don't care what you say or how you slice it. That's the key ingredient, pricing it right. Mm. Not the right answer that people want to hear, though. No. Yeah. Well, you have to get one of these people to help you, though, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of these, that you have to do uh, house uh, advertising, internet exposure. Well, advertising today is all one on online. I right. mean, it's all people shop online. Forget right. about spending any money anywhere else. Uh -huh. But it's still not going to help unless it's priced right. I see. This is from Laura, live. I'm 55, buying my first property in Chicago. Is it worth to buy a house versus a condo to eliminate monthly assessments? You know, Laura, that depends upon your appetite for maintenance. If you really don't want to mow the front yard or hire somebody or fix the boiler, a condo's the way to go. It's maintenance free. If you're asking me which holds its value or appreciates better, houses in any market always do slightly better than condos. But who cares? It's about enjoying your life. And if you're 55, you probably have maybe 30 good years left. Why not do it in a place that you're going to enjoy? Right. That's the main thing. Right. As my dad used to say, nobody can tell you where to live or who to marry. Those are the two decisions you have to make all by yourself. A lot of parents try to do that, though. <laughs> I know. This is <laughs> life good from dad. Stacy. <laughs> Hi. How can a first-time buyer get a good deal? I want to buy an apartment. I'm 37. I don't own anything except my car. With the down payment I can put on my mortgage and loan interest are so, so high. Help. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you have to take the amount of money, the cash, I shouldn't say cash flow, the amount of money you're, you're comfortable putting out every month. What is that number where you're comfortable putting out every month? And then go to the free service of a mortgage broker and say, I could afford $2,200 a month. Can you back that in for me to tell me what to buy? You could also do this online on any of the bank websites. But if you're not good with money, I say, use a mortgage broker. They're for free anyway, and they know what they're doing. And then you know what your price point is. And then and go out and shop the market okay the key is getting out there just it costs nothing to go online and shop the market but a lot of people don't know what that magic number is and that's your starting point this is live from Sasha Barbara I'm in a bind I sold my small home in Minnesota last year moved to New York I know I need to reinvest in the market but frankly I can't afford anything in the city that I like what should I do to avoid taking a tax hit well the only way to avoid the tax hit is to reinvest or to, well, it's too late for you to trade your property. You're going to have to reinvest. But I'm going to tell you, taking a tax hit is better than jumping into something you're not comfortable doing. You know what? You made, a, you made money. You made a profit. So the government wants their share of it. But I think the, uh, the first priority is what do you want for yourself in life? Do you want to buy something and get out there and hustle? But if not, take the tax hit and be comfortable. This is live from Rita. This is an important question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. With so many people filing for foreclosure for whatever reason on their homes, do you think these people will ever be able to purchase a home in the future? If so, how long will they have to wait? You know what? The price you pay for foreclosure today is much less than it used to be. Number one, you don't lose your credit cards. A lot of people don't know that. Whatever credit cards you have in hand, you still hold. What you do lose is good credit ratings, and it's typically now today, more typically five years, sometimes ten years. But you can still go out and buy another home, sometimes within three to four years. A lot of people don't know that. So the stigma that was always associated with foreclosures, because they're so rampant today, is not what it used to be. All right, 
You'll mm -hmm. still get credit. You'll still get a car loan. And in a few years, you might be able to go out and buy another house. But you want to know, if people are losing their house from foreclosure. They need five years to recover anyway. Right, They're right. not running out to buy another right. house. Exactly. Okay? exactly. And you know, one other thing I should mention, if you go to a new development site, new condominiums, uh, new housing development, very often the developer will give you the funding. So sometimes you could buy right away. I'm not endorsing foreclosures, right. but I'm saying it's not as bad as it used to uh -huh. be. Uh-huh. We can get used to anything, can't we? Mm. Yeah. Is, Seems like no big deal exactly. anymore, right? Exactly. Yeah. Good. This is live from Miriam. I'm trying to convince my retired parents to sell their house, which they bought 27 years ago, and to move into a smaller condo. Mm. They don't need all the room of their house now. It's just the two of them. But they're reluctant. How can I present this to them as a good option? Well, there's two thoughts that come into my mind. Uh, one is, why are they reluctant? Uh, for most older people, they just don't want to pack stuff up and make the move. It's stressful, it's emotionally draining, because what they're really doing is packing away all these wonderful memories when right. they raise their kids. That's one. The other thing is, you can really offer them a tremendous lifestyle and let them stay in the home if you look into a reverse money mortgage, because that pays your parents every month a set sum, however you want to arrange it, to live and to vacation and enjoy their grandchildren and still stay in their home, and there's absolutely no risk for it. The only downside is you pay like one extra percentage point on the interest rates, but who cares? Rates are so cheap right now. Right. Why not have your cake and eat it too? Right. Lastly, let me just say your parents are in charge. All that being said, good luck. <laughs> well, yeah. You don't know, right? You can't move. Your, um, I tried yeah. to move my mother out of her house uh, after my dad died mm -hmm. because she was in this really big house all alone. My sister and brother and I were concerned about that. But she said, "This is our home. Mm, our home. You know, it's a lot and of exactly. lot of emotion in that." And she and uh, she wouldn't even take my father's clothes out of the closet. Mm. And I said, "Mother, you really should move the clothes out, mm. you know? or she get said, someone to move them for her." And we said we would do it. And you know what she said? But then there would just be a lot of empty hangers. Oh my gosh, it's so sad. Exactly. So mm. she she really had it figured out that what made her the most comfortable mm. was that the clothes over there in a the closet to be in our home mm. and, and you accepted it, I, which course. a lot of kids don't we, do, by well, the way. Of course we did. Of course we did. Uh, this is live from Jim. Best advice for starting your own company after the age of 50? <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> All right. The odds on winning starting a company when you're older versus younger are much stacked against you. It doesn't mean it can't be done. I mean, you've got a lot of famous people. Who's the guy? Was it Nathan? No, not Nathan. I forget. Some famous. What? The McDonald's guy. When did he start? 55? Oh, so right. you have you have exceptions, of course. But you know what you need to do? You need to really get an outside person tell you what they really think. Most people who start their companies ask their family, friends, and wife, what do you think? And you know what? They love you. They're going to tell you it's the greatest. Go and ask a bunch of young people what they think. If they don't get it, chances are good it's not a good idea. That's very good advice. This is from Lainey. I really want to learn how to invest in real estate. I've cleared everything on my credit except my student loans. Well, that's big. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the best way to start investing? The best way is to buy the house next door. I don't mean necessarily literally, but to invest in the neighborhood you know. So go on a little ride on Sunday afternoon and go up and down the streets of your neighborhood and look for the dumpy house that looks like the people don't have enough money to fix it up. And walk up to the door, give them a little note if they're not home, or introduce yourself. Maybe that takes a little more courage. Or hit and run and leave a note <laughs> and just say, I'm interested in buying your home. Would you have any interest? You could also, of course, work with a broker. But you know what I find? When you're buying your own neck of the woods, you don't lose your shirt. Where people lose everything, or not lose everything, but lose too much, is when they go out of their ballpark and go investing in what's the new, coolest, best place. Never a good idea. Really? That's fabulous. This is from Veronica. Hi, Barbara. I'm contemplating purchasing a condo in East Harlem as an investment. Do you think it's a good idea, especially now that the developers are so willing to negotiate? Well, I guess if East Harlem isn't your neighborhood, mm -hmm. you wouldn't really suggest it? No, but if you're asking, uh, theoretically, is East Harlem going to be on the rise or is it on the rise? It's not on the rise now because everything's been shot dead by this real estate bubble. But let me tell you, every up-and-coming neighborhood in East Harlem was clearly up-and-coming before the bubble burst is going to return to being an up-and-coming neighborhood the minute we're out of the woods. So it's a good time to get in early. But you know what you ought to be doing? Shopping and shopping and shopping and promising yourself you're not going to buy a thing until you see at least 30 places. And then, of course, trying to negotiate a very good deal. You could shop the new condo market. You could shop townhouses that get split into four or five units. You could shop with a friend, whatever. The key here is shopping and being really a pain in the neck. Good. 
I like being a pain in the neck. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> this is live from Jen. How do you stay motivated if several of your deals fall apart? When you what what kind of deals? You have any idea? It doesn't but, say. Uh, motivated when several of your deals. Well, let's take it both ways. If you're talking about you're buying a home and those deals are falling apart, you are then definitely underbidding too much or you're buying in a rising market and it's running away from you, so bid higher. If you're talking about deals like entrepreneurship <laughs> and your deals fall it now, it wouldn't make sense. Who knows? No. That's what, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. This is live from Vicki. What is your feeling on turnkey properties, such as ones in the Caribbean or Florida? Are they a good investment? Well, turnkey usually means, if I'm understanding you well, Vicki, it simply means you don't have to do any work. You walk in, all the furnishings are there, everything's great. I love it because it's an easy package, but I'll tell you what I don't like about it. Most people buy them thinking, oh, I'll use them a few weeks a year and then I'll rent it out for all this, and the agents on the sites will often tell you high values for renting, and they never tell you how many weeks a year your neighbor is actually able to rent it. So if you're not going to move there permanently, be real careful about those rental estimates. That's where people get in trouble. So mm -hmm. forget about the turnkey. The real million dollar question is how many weeks a year are the people in this particular complex able to rent the units and for how much that's great this is live from Jane and this is one of the very important question I am one of those people who's now stuck with a home with a market value much less than what I bought it for yeah. what suggestions do you have for people like me well, if you don't have a variable rate mortgage or adjustable rate mortgage, it's what is more commonly called, and you're stuck in a long-term mortgage, you should go back to the actual bank that originated your loan and try to renegotiate. If they think they're going to lose you, they might renegotiate. All right. And I had another thought, but I lost it. What was the question? The question yeah. was if I had a I, good thought. Yeah, if 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 if, uh, if it's now worth under. The oh, market yeah. value. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what? I would say that right now in this country, roughly three out of ten homes are worth a lot less than the mortgage. Okay? So if you can afford to pay it and stay with it, no problem. But if you can afford to renegotiate it, and most of them, long term mortgages are renegotiable, you should really shop the market and see if you can get a better rate. If all, one other thing, I think maybe what she's driving at is you can't afford it, which is all, what a lot of people are in, what you should do is call your bank and ask for a modification of your loan. They'll give you a modification of your loan if you put it in writing, if it's certified mail, and if you're a pain in the neck calling back again and again. Because the truth is banks talk the language, but they don't do the language for the most part. It's the squeaky wheel gets oiled on that one. And they'll take it because they'd rather do that than not have anything, right? Yes, they will, but if you're a pain in the neck, you have to be a pain in the neck and ride this. Banks are understaffed. They have lots of problems, right. and they only pay attention to the people making the most noise. Yeah. As my mother used to say, the squeaky wheel gets oiled. It's true. There's <laughs> a reason that's gone on for that's generations, right. that expression. Right? This is live from Victoria. How long are you supposed to live in a house that you buy before selling it? And also, what's your opinion on flipping a home? What does flipping a home mean? Flipping a home means it's like a thing of the past. It's hard to do now. You buy a home at, say, $150,000. You improve it with another $20,000. You just flip it for $200,000. Quick money. Uh -huh. It's it's a very treacherous game. There are mm. professional flippers that are in that game, but if you haven't done it before, it's risky business. No I doubt. never even heard of it. Oh, flipping. Yeah, you know what? How it used to happen in any big rising market, people all come in and become professional flippers with one deal. And it's great because even if you're stupid, the market erases your errors because the prices are going right. up. You know? But for most people, it's a, it's a, you really have to know what you're doing. This is from Donna regarding the show Shark Tank. What type of products are the producers looking for to put on that show? Well, if you have any product right now, you should be on ABC's Shark Tank website because the truth is, is they are now soliciting people and interviewing them right now for a July taping. The products that they love is when the entrepreneur is a character, so don't forget to include your face or even a video so they could see you're a character and people who could walk and talk and speak okay. <laughs> that being said, the wackier the product, the better the TV. Doesn't mean you'll get bought, but the wackier the product, the better TV. Wow. This is live from Kim. I'm in the market to buy my next home. Fortunately, I can afford to buy a home with cash. Don't need a mortgage. Should I get a mortgage anyway and then invest my money elsewhere? Can I tell you, if you don't want to owe a mortgage on your house, every accountant attorney out there will tell you you should really leverage yourself. You're going to miss the tax deduction, blah, blah, blah. My feeling is it depends how you're comfortable. After all, it's a home first and an investment second. And if you're comfortable with no mortgage and you're really not 
just not happy with taking on debt, then don't get a mortgage. If yet you are a great stockbroker and you can play the stocks and make money with your money that way and you don't mind a mortgage, then get a mortgage. <coughs> it depends upon how you're wired. It's very personal, that call. It is. Uh, this is from Evan Fox. My husband, 55, and I, 49, will have our house paid off in two years. What is a good money investment? Stay in the paid off house or buy a bigger house? In two years, our cars and our kids in college will be paid off as well. Well, you know, most people, when the kids are grown, trade down rather than trading up, right? Mm -hmm. So you can certainly trade down. If you're in an area like 60% of the U.S. right now, prices are still going down, you're going to take, say, let's say, and I don't know what area you're in, let's say you take a 20% loss on the big house. You're in Idaho. Idaho. And that's a little rough in Idaho, with a few exceptions <laughs> in there, but rough. All right, let's say you take a 15% loss on your house. I'm just making that up because I don't know when you bought it. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to buy the next place at 15% off. But let's say rather than buying in Idaho, you go to an area where prices are appreciating, like say um, Northern California. What's going to happen then is you're going to reinvest that rough money that you've taken out into a really good blue chip area where prices are going up and you're going to be ahead of the game. Depends again upon what you like. This is from Unmistakable. Unmistakable. That's she right. better be good looking or he better be <laughs> handsome. Yes. I saw your interview with Jonathan Fields. You spoke about a three year period following the struggle of your business where you were saw the sale of your business where you struggled with your confidence. I've left a fifteen year job mm -hmm. that I did quite well at despite no education and now I'm experiencing the same phenomenon. Any advice to get going again? Yeah, you know what? That's a rough one and probably the thing I'm least good at. I'm very good being successful and hustling when I've got a lot of traction and things are spinning and you ride that wheel and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. I found when I sold my business because I was used to having a thousand people adoring me, I found that it was a very rough transition. You know what I told myself day in and day out when things weren't going my way? I said to myself, I have the right to be here. I have the right to get out of life what I want, when I want it. I have the right to be successful again. And even though in my heart of hearts I didn't really believe I was going to be successful again, I found that just by pushing and pushing, the same old pushing got me to where I wanted to right. be. You've just got to push, not talk, ignore the negative thinking, it's normal, but just keep pushing. I have a motto. What's that? Never face the facts. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Never face the facts or you won't get out of bed in the morning. Oh, my God. That's what I think. Okay. Um, this is from I'll Nicole. I have to think about that one. Well, I actually got it from Ruth Gordon. That's what she used to say. Never face the facts. Uh, hi, Barbara. Is now a good time to purchase a home, or do you think the market's going to take another huge hit? Depends on where you live. You know, 60% of the markets are still going down, but 40% of them have already turned the corner oh. on their way up. So what you do is go to your local broker or go to your local media articles that are out there and see what's happening with <coughs> your market. One of the very easy way to find out if the market has turned is count the for sale signs. Go through your maybe five blocks. If you have more than two for sale signs per block, the market's still going to go down. Wow. Wow. Once they disappear, you know things are happening pretty good. Uh -huh. mm. This is live from Kate. I'm 55, recently laid off. I own my own house, and I've got eight years left on the mortgage, but I'm sick of owning a money pit. Should mm. I just sell it now? Of course, you're overdue. I could tell from the emotion, just in that short question. Dump it. Get rid of it. Even if you have to take a loss, it's time to move on. Life happens in funny ways. You're supposed to have chapters. This is a chapter you should be moving on to. Good. Do it, Kate. Do it. This is from Louise. Barbara, I'd like to buy my daughter a home as a wedding gift, but I'm wondering whether the home should be in my name or hers. What are the implications? You know, it's complicated. You should go over to a tax accountant and pay him his $200 an hour, whatever he charges, and find out how to structure that deal. There's four different ways you could gift it. You could co-own it with your child, but they all have extreme tax ramifications. And so I'm not going to give you that advice, but the best advice is spend the 300 bucks and ask a tax accountant. You'll be thanking me you ever did. But there's something here that's, that this woman, Louise, is missing out. Mm -hmm. The options she's asked, suggesting are uh, the, the, the house should be in her name or her daughter's name, but that house is going to be in her daughter's and her husband's name, right? 
Uh, well, I don't know where the husband walks in. But well, I mean, who, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, if it's a wedding gift. Uh, well, she could, you know, what, uh, you know what the smartest thing you could do, which is what really wealthy people do when they want to give real estate to their children? Mm -hmm. You can loan them the money, the mortgage, and then you could forgive it for $7,500 a year for the rest of their life. And if your husband does it with you, that's $15,000 a year you can forgive on the mortgage. That gives them the money. They could put it in their name. They get the tax deduction. But you're just helping them get their first house a second house, whatever mm -hmm. it is, and you get the tax benefit of having that forgiven. But again, I'm not an accountant. You've got to talk to a tax, atta right. a tax accountant. This is from yeah. Melissa. Is it a good time to refinance? It depends what your rate is. If your rate is anything more than a point and a half above four and a half percent right now, right now, so if it's five and a half percent and above, of course you should be refinancing mm -hmm. without a doubt. But a lot of these mortgage instruments have prepayment penalties, and you know when you refinance, you have to prepay the mortgage with the new money, and that sometimes triggers a big, like a excise. It's not called a, whatever it is a penalty. I couldn't think of, and so sometimes it doesn't pay. You really have to look at the document, but typically you should be doing it. You are so good. Oh my God! I'm just so excited you're here. Really, you're giving well, you really good advice. Well, you must have these questions. No, no, no. <laughs> Is there coming Usually in there's a few that stump. But this whole uh, point of Mondays with Marlo is mm -hmm. to give our community real information. Yeah. And you really are helping people, and that's it's so good. exciting to me. Well, they're good questions that apply to a lot of people. Well, they care. They're you know, they, these people are are writing in because they know you've got the goods. Um, I need some good advice. This is live from Carol. I need some good advice on how to successfully sell a summer home in this bad market. A summer home, actually you're a little late on the draw. The best time to sell a summer home is early spring. The worst time is in the summer months because you know what? Buyers are shopping. It's like the leftover buyers and if your house isn't yet sold, you are a leftover and people take advantage of it when they bid. So I would say take your home off the market, wait till the fall market and even better, wait till next spring unless you're desperate to sell. Well, you know, we have so many more questions, and I'm trying to pick one last one because I'm being given the hook Make here. Make it a short one. I know. I'm trying to find a really tiny one. A yes-no so answer. Yeah, I, I, it's very hard to find the yes-no answer. These questions are so, uh, well, uh, let's see. What are the current real estate myths about buying and selling? Is there like a myth for each yeah. one that we could share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for a buyer, the one that amazes me all the time is there's no such thing as sharpshooting in the real estate market. A lot of people just want to buy at the right time. You know, life's not that way. It's messier. Uh -huh. you, you know, your life gets in the way. So forget about sharpshooting the real estate market. And the myth that is most erroneous, is that a word? Or mistake, whatever that word right. is I'm groping for, for the home seller is that you can ask a better price if your home is unique or a little bit better than the neighbors. The biggest mistake every homeowner makes, bar none, is that they overprice the home coming out of the gate. You know what? If you've had more than seven showings and you haven't had a bid, your home is grossly overpriced. That's what the national average is. Seven showings, you should get a bid. So you have to price your home well. And what do you do if it's a, then you bring it down, then it looks bad, right? Well, you know what happens is with, in the world of everything being public online, people can see those little price incremental drops. And right. you know what they say? Come and get it. Make a low bid. This right. person, you just want to nail it right on the first part and, and stick to it. And, and stick, stick to, to it. it. Well, yeah. and hope you're right and get a bid right away. Right, right. Every house sells. Every house, bar none, if the price is right. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. You're My wonderful. Just you're wonderful. I can't wait to take the listing on your penthouse. <laughs> oh, no. I want to get you're rich. Not. No, you're not taking this house. <laughs> Leave it to me and you will. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you're terrible. Thank you so much. We're out of time. It just flew by. She was so fabulous. For you, maybe. It was, uh -huh. <laughs> That's funny. But we loved it. And the interview will be up in just a few hours on AOL. And join us next week for some great health and beauty tips from past experts. And then in June, do we have a lineup for you. We've got Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Deepak Chopra, and the terrific Jillian Michaels. So tune in to Mondays and Marlowe. We'll see you next week.